Hello and welcome to Maximum Blondie, the first talking book about the band. It was written and researched by Keith Rodway. Music is by Amanda Thompson and it's read by Nancy McLean. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. I really didn't want to do the blues, you know, I really didn't feel like I was a blues singer and I, I didn't feel like I was a, like a Grace Slick or something like that, you know, so sort of had to make a compromise somehow and make it a rock, R&B, somehow identity and it, somehow it all melted down into Blondie. Blondie emerged from the New York art rock scene in the middle of the 1970s, just as punk rock in Britain was being born. But whereas British punk was a street-level reaction to changes in society, the new wave in America was more of a continuation of a conceptual art movement, popularised by Andy Warhol ten years previously. A vital thread that bound them together was the music of Jonathan Richman, who had in turn been heavily influenced by the Velvet Underground, and with a debut LP under his belt, actually produced by former Velvet Underground member John Cale. A solid clique soon formed in New York around those who either worked with or parallel to Richmond's band, The Modern Lovers. Soon, a healthy alternative rock scene was developing, with Talking Heads, Television and Patti Smith as its heavyweight major icons, and with Blondie as their pop counterpart. Like all good pop music, Blondie's many chart hits were instantly likeable and memorable. They avoided the hints of willful isolation and self-indulgence that blighted the careers of those around them who took themselves too seriously. They understood the value of directness and economy in a scene driven by radio airplay. If you waffle or become irrelevant, people will tune to another station. Their songs were short, sharp and to the point. The group kept abreast with fashion but never enslaved themselves to it. And unlike Patti Smith, who laid on the tortured intellectual feminist bit with a trowel so heavily laden it needed to be held in both hands, Blondie singer Debbie Harry became a female icon of a very different kind. She was sexy, intelligent and playful. And very definitely, nobody's fool. Yet, the music industry was still the music industry. Male-dominated, sexist and obsessed with sales to the detriment of creativity, It tried to portray Blondie as a solo female act, a fluffy nymphette against a backdrop of supporting players. Needless to say, this was hugely unfair on the rest of the band. Yet in essence, it was a formula that worked. Blondie achieved huge success with their third album, Parallel Lines, which became an instant classic and seemed to freeze frame a point in time, as do so many classic albums. With four major hit singles, including the disco crossover hit Heart of Glass, this seemed to be the pinnacle of their career. Following their flirtation with disco, they similarly predicted the importance of rap and left the way clear with their split in 1982 for Madonna to take over as the world's favourite pop blonde bombshell. For 16 years, the world's most successful new wave pop band lay silent. And then... In 1998, with Debbie Harry having become in the meantime a film actress and jazz singer, the group reformed and recorded a new album. This was followed in 2003 by a follow-up LP, The Curse of Blondie, and suddenly the band was in the headlines again, with the intervening years having done nothing to blunt their relevance. This seemed to confirm that the rise and slow decline of dance music as a fashionable consumer commodity was somehow complete. It hadn't taken over the world, and probably now never would. The classic pop template of snappy songs, smart clothes and sly intelligence was timeless and invincible. And Blondie are still here to prove it. Actually, you know, dreamed of being a movie star. I always sort of saying, "Well, you know, you'll be sorry when I'm rich and famous." You know, and I think all of the uh, blondes of uh, cinema were very fascinating and just so sexy and so hot. 
Deborah Harry was born on July the 1st, 1945, in Miami, Florida. She never knew her biological parents as she was given up for adoption soon after she was born. She was raised in New Jersey, just outside New York, by her adoptive parents, Catherine and Richard Harry. As a child, Debbie fantasized that she was the daughter of Marilyn Monroe. Her mother's friends would often remark on how pretty she was, and when one of them mentioned the comparison with Marilyn, it lit a spark in the young Deborah's imagination. The comparison remains to an extent superficially appropriate. Though less dysfunctional than Marilyn, she radiated at the height of Blondie's fame, a warmth and blonde bombshell charm. She became something like a Monroe for a new age, willing perhaps to be exploited initially as a male fantasy pinup, but tempered with far more confidence and self-determination. Debbie had always wanted to be a singer, when she found herself at an early age singing along with radio and knowing intuitively where the melody was going next, she sensed that something significant was happening. Many young people growing up in the classic era of rock and roll doubtless harboured similar fantasies. The post-war West was creatively drab. Rock and roll was a blaze of colour in an otherwise monochrome world. Debbie was particularly influenced by classic girl groups of the early 1960s. It was here that she found much of the inspiration for the early musical partnerships she formed. Of these, the most significant was with Chris Stein. Debbie and Chris met at a gig in New York in 1972. She was on stage, he was in the audience. They formed, there and then, the start of a lifelong musical collaboration. But as well as wanting to be a singer, Debbie also wanted to be a painter. Intrinsically, she wanted to be an artist, and in the 1960s, if you wanted to join the art world, you went to New York. There, you got as close as you could to the heart of the scene, which meant Andy Warhol's factory. It was here that the most influential figure of the 1960s art world cast his curious spell on all that would come afterwards. And for rock and roll, and pop music generally, it meant more than the music of the Velvet Underground. It meant the notion of art as a consumer commodity, the insistence on superficiality and the cult of celebrity worship that grips the Western world today as all the world and his performing dog queues round the block for their 15 minutes of fame. So, Debbie moved to New York, where she joined a succession of avant-garde groups beginning with the Triangles in 1966, followed by the first national unifrenic church and bank. Then, in 1968, she became a member of Wind and the Willows, who recorded two albums for Capitol. Debbie had become a recording artiste. Still, global fame wasn't ready for her just then, and she held down a variety of daytime jobs, including a stint as a Playboy bunny girl. Between 1968 and 1969, she worked as a waitress at Max's Kansas City, at that time a magnet for the best bands in the city. It was here that she got to meet many of the artists and hangers-on from the factory, a focal point for the intense wave of creative energy that enveloped the city's bohemian underclass. But by 1969, the luster was beginning to wear off the 60s dream, and Debbie quit Wind and the Willows to return home to her parents and take stock of her life. In 1972, at the age of 26, she moved back to New York and formed an all-girl band called The Stilettos. The New York Dolls were the most intriguing band in town and a new scene was emerging, one that would become the New York new wave of rock music. It was here that Debbie would finally find her artistic home and here also that she would make that fateful, crucial meeting with Chris Stein. I met Debbie. Debbie used to play with a girl trio called the Stilettos, and then you know I used to, I went to a couple of their shows, and they never had permanent musicians, so I joined that band. And well, yep. Chris was born in Brooklyn, New York, on January the fifth, nineteen fifty, in a household remarkable for its libertarian attitudes. His parents both aspired to be artists, and Chris was lucky enough to be raised in a relatively relaxed atmosphere that encouraged creativity. His parents bought him his first guitar when he was 11. 
In his early teens, he painted his bedroom black and covered the walls with speakers. After that, his house became the local centre for long, chaotic jam sessions. Chris and his friends smoked pot and made prodigious amounts of noise. Tragedy struck when he was 15 and his father died of a heart attack. Chris was at a vulnerable age and was profoundly affected by the sudden loss. Over the next few years, he attempted to hide from his grief in drugs and in 1969 his experiments with LSD had led him to the care of a psychiatric unit. While he was there, his draft papers from the army arrived. If he had passed the medical examination that all potential recruits had to undergo, he may have ended up in Vietnam. But he displayed such an impressive array of the symptoms of psychiatric illness that his draft failed. There was a happy ending of sorts. Chris was released in time to be able to travel to the Woodstock Festival, held in upstate New York that summer. In autumn of that same year, he became eligible for sponsored rehabilitation and enrolled on a photography course at the New York School of Visual Arts. In 1972, he travelled to a New York Dolls gig and befriended Eric Emerson, leader of the support group The Magic Tramps. Chris was primarily attracted by their flamboyant stage act. Eric hung out with the people who hung out with the people who knew the dolls, who were themselves fueled by an ethic that was an amalgam of disparate influences. They took the camp of the Rolling Stones, the glam of Bowie and Roxy Music, and the trash ethic of the late 1960s garage punk scene. They wove all this together with a wasted cheek look pioneered by Keith Richards and came up with the ignition spark for the explosive art rock movement that consumed New York's countercultural hip elite in the following years. As a satellite figure on this scene, Chris was invited to the Stiletto's second gig. The group was an ambitious project that embraced Debbie's obsession with the girl groups of the early 1960s, such as the Shirelles and the Ronettes. Add to this rhythm and blues, soul, theatre and echoes of the emerging disco scene that would flower in the New York gay underground to become a huge influence on pop music in the 1970s. It would eventually mutate to become the global dance music scene a decade later. The attraction between Chris and Debbie was mutual and instantaneous. He standing in the audience watching her, she singing to the silhouette beyond the lights. In the coming months, they would embark on a sometimes stormy, but seldom mundane relationship. They were working their way into the heart of the nascent New York punk enclave. The Stilettos underwent rapid personnel changes, and by 1973, their lineup included Debbie, Chris and Fred Smith, who would go on to become an integral part of Tom Verlaine and Richard Lloyd's band, Television. Fred should not be confused with the Fred Sonic Smith, who played bass in the MC5 and became the husband of Patti Smith. In 1973, this lineup of the Stilettos began a series of gigs at a former biker's bar in New York called CBGB's, a central venue for many of the bands playing in New York at that time. In contrast to the ironic exhibitionism of the Stilettos, television, the pride of the more intellectual fans of the new wave, were moody, serious, wore short hair and ripped shirts. Their music was characterised by a kind of angst-ridden melodrama that might possibly be defined as an acquired taste. The Stilettos continued on their career path, bound for doom, but headed recklessly for glory until they disintegrated amid the usual debris of fractured egos, irreconcilable differences in musical direction, paranoia and distrust. Chris and Debbie's private life was no less chaotic. They drifted and lacked focus. They had a vision of what they wanted to achieve, but little practical idea of how to achieve it in the real world. They, and their compatriots on the New York punk scene, wanted to provide a refuge for those whose optimism had been sapped by repeated exposure to their older siblings, Eagles and Joni Mitchell records. They yearned to put the celebratory energy back into pop music. In 
We didn't know it was going to make waves, and none of us really had record deals, you know, at that early stage. But looking back on it, I think, oh, wow, I was just so lucky to be there, and what an exciting time, and how did that really happen? By 1976, rock music on both sides of the Atlantic was in a sorry state. In Europe, it had been dominated since the late 1960s by the progressive and heavy rock bands whose signature uniform was young men with long greasy hair and grey trench coats. Their sisters listened to weepy, bedsit angst singer-songwriters like James Taylor and Cat Stevens. In America, a blues rock band whose Heartland audience had once been students in dingy pubs in South London reinvented themselves as cocaine-driven soft rockers, whose offstage incestuous real-life soap saga was often more compelling than their music. They were called Fleetwood Mac and gave birth to a phenomenon known as adult-orientated rock, which made becoming an adult seem a thoroughly depressing prospect. More fun by far were the Ramones, the cartoon epitome of New York punk. They came on like gangling, awkward losers in grubby leather and black drainpipe Levi's. They played fast and their songs were short. They celebrated the energy and uncertainty of young adulthood and were well-versed in the vital art of self-parody. Chris and Debbie's search for an identity came with the name Blondie, an epithet often shouted at Debbie by passing truck drivers. Previously, they had been known briefly as the Angel and the Snake. With Blondie, they had a name at least. But as anyone who has ever written a few songs and tried to form a rock band will tell you, the first basic essential is a good drummer. And while auditioning an endless stream of mediocre drummers, they happened upon the answer to their dreams. When Clem Burke began to play, they knew they had found their man. Clement Burke was born on the 24th of November 1955 in New York. When he joined Blondie nearly 20 years later, he was unnervingly focused and proficient. The group enjoyed a brief period of relative stability until Fred Smith announced his defection to television, with whom he reckoned he had better prospects. After Smith's departure, Gray Valentine joined the group to fill the vacant bass slot. Blondie embarked on a seven-month weekend residency at CBGB's, often sharing the bill with such acts as the Ramones, Television, Talking Heads or Patti Smith. Blondie expanded to a five-piece band with the arrival of keyboard player Jimmy Destry, who was born on the 13th of April 1954. Just prior to this, a British entrepreneur called Malcolm McLaren had managed the New York Dolls and had actually managed to pull them into shape before their inevitable decline. He went on to manage the Sex Pistols, who based themselves in part on the frenetic pub rock popularised in Britain by Dr Feelgood. The Feelgoods were too well disciplined to cut it as punks, but their influence on both the British and American groups of the time was crucial to the emerging punk ethic. By 1976, Blondie's repertoire included Ex Offender, Die Young, Stay Pretty, and Heart of Glass. CBGB's had become a trendy place for New York's beautiful people to hang out in. One of the many curious celebrity visitors who came to check out the vibrant new scene was veteran record producer Richard Gotterer, who had written and produced a hit single for the 1960s girl group The Crystals, and who had produced Hang On Sloopy for The McCoys. With legendary music biz figure Seymour Stein, he had founded Bell Records, which later became Sire, home to Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Talking Heads, and a few years later, the queen of platinum blonde ambition, Madonna. Richard Gotterer expressed an interest in producing a Blondie single, and the result was Ex Offender, backed by In The Sun, which was released on Private Stock Records. Though a flop, it did enough to convince Private Stock to put up the money for a Blondie album, and the group spent the final months of 1976 recording the songs they had perfected during the seven months spent playing every damp toilet in New York. They embarked on a hectic recording schedule, resulting in an album called simply Blondie, which was released in January 1977. By then, the group was beginning to inspire favourable reviews in the New York press, and they'd attracted the attention of Los Angeles DJ and club owner Rodney Bigenheimer, who took them to play the Whiskey A Go Go, the area's most prestigious venue. Audiences there took to them immediately, 
Their songs were sharp and witty, and their style was mod revival, with thin ties and tight straight leg trousers. They signed to a manager, Peter Leeds, and were approached by David Bowie and Iggy Pop, who had heard their album whilst recording in Berlin. They were invited to tour with their heroes, supporting them as they promoted Iggy's classic punk era LP, The Idiot. It was, to say the least, an auspicious start. It wasn't always fun, you know. Sometimes we were kind of desperate for money and just plain desperate <laughs> about everything. Um, but you don't really get many opportunities like that. And in retrospect, I can really appreciate it, of course, much more. After the Iggy Pop gigs, Blondie signed up to tour Britain with Television, who at that time were the darlings of the new wave elite, who regarded punk as music for subhumans but who saw the new wave as the renaissance flowering of the new rock music. Having been treated as equals by Bowie and Iggy, they found themselves playing second-class citizens to the royalty that television apparently believed themselves to be. Blondie enjoyed Britain, finding British fans to be more receptive, sophisticated and exuberant than their American counterparts. 1977 was the year of Queen Elizabeth's 25th year jubilee, a supposed outpouring of joy for the nation's matriarch. It was probably the last time that the royal family could bask in such unquestioning adoration from its bourgeois heartland. Feelings among young people were often much less deferential, particularly among Britain's working class, who found themselves marginalised by the standoff between the unions and a government that was out of touch with the reality of life in urban centres. Endless strikes and three-day working weeks were taking their toll on morale. The punks felt that nobody cared about them, and they were probably right. The national press saw them as an aberration of an otherwise decent and orderly society. But it was actually very simple. They were bored, disillusioned and disaffected. Mainstream culture had become bloated, bland and smug. The punks were high on adrenaline. They wanted to have fun. The traditional rock press, still obsessed by the dreary drones of Pink Floyd and the thumbs-up inanity of Wings, was initially at a loss to know what to do with them. It was hard to believe that the nation's giant hit factories, acts like the Rolling Stones, Elton John, Queen and Led Zeppelin, could be challenged so effectively by the scores of do-it-yourself punk bands that seemed to flourish overnight in the subterranean clubs and bars of Britain's urban centres. But it was nonetheless a fact. For a brief 18 months, these lumbering dinosaurs were having to glance warily over their shoulders. Even the Rolling Stones were sufficiently shaken up to make a decent album. Some Girls became their best LP since the turn of the decade, and their last great record before their final descent into camp self-parody. This was the backdrop to Blondie's first tour of Britain. On the northern leg of the television tour, they received a rapturous reception in Manchester. This great former industrial centre would soon become the source of much of the best new music over the next 10 years, giving the world the Buzzcocks, the Fall, the Smiths, New Order, the Happy Mondays and the Stone Roses. It was also here that Blondie began to pick up favourable press. Not only did Blondie find that the British audiences were more mature and sophisticated than the US, but in Manchester they were the most receptive of all. The British rock press soon started to turn the tables on television and Blondie. Television arrived in Britain as the toast of the new underground music. But soon Blondie began to make a bigger impression. Their music was less serious and self-indulgent. Put simply, it was more fun. They displayed wit and intelligence, but didn't let that get in the way of giving their audience a good time. Yet despite being the subject of such acclaim and intense exposure, they were hardly making any money. Sales of their first album began to pick up, but the material was becoming well-worn. And there were other problems. Gary Valentine was ambitious and competitive. His flamboyance on stage made it seem as if he were competing for attention with Debbie. Like it or not, she was the focus of the attention on stage, 
In fact, much to the rest of the group's constant annoyance, it was often assumed that Debbie was Blondie and the others her backing band. Finally, the group's manager, Peter Leeds, rang Gary to tell him he was sacked. Even though his song, I'm Touched by Your Presence, Dear, became a firm favourite in the group's repertoire, he was not there later to enjoy its success. I think it was a, a lot of pressure. I, I think our original record deal called for three albums a year, so that was uh, uh, impossible. Peter Leeds had become frustrated with Private Stock's apparent inability to successfully promote the group, and negotiations with Chrysalis Records were begun, resulting in a triumphant new signing. The group's second album, Plastic Letters, took six weeks to record. Richard Gotterer produced for the second time. With newcomer Frank Infante on bass, they set about planning a world tour to promote their new record. But before the tour kicked off, they played a few nights in Los Angeles, where they met a young British musician called Nigel Harrison. The group were impressed by him, particularly when they invited him to play with them, and he turned up having learned all their songs. Subsequently, Blondie became a six-piece band, with Frank Infante moving to rhythm guitar to allow Nigel Harrison to occupy the bass slot. The single In the Flesh was a big hit in Australia. Chrysalis was a far more professional and worldly wise outfit than private stock. Having identified Australia as a good place to cash in on this minor triumph, the band were duly packed off there to consolidate their newfound success. Wherever they went, they were besieged by journalists and high-ranking city officials who wanted to know if Debbie really did strip naked during Rip Her to Shreds. If she did, they were suitably morally affronted. If not, they were secretly mortified. She couldn't win. Their tour took them from Australia through Asia to Thailand and on to China. Here they saw rather more of the stark realities of communism than they felt comfortable with. Then it was back to Europe, tired and disorientated. Despite six months' hard work, a number one for Denis Denis in Britain and much hard-earned favourable press, the record company was still not satisfied. What was spelled out to them was the familiar mantra for any band wanting global success. Unless they made it big in America, it was all a waste of time, and they had come home broke. Furthermore, America was of the firm opinion that Blondie were punks, and that was not what the great American public wanted. If they were going to crack the world's largest youth market, they needed a change of image. Though popular in Europe, and having made something of a name for themselves in other territories besides, it seemed that the next album must be the one to break them into the big time. Accordingly, they brought in Mike Chapman, the great pop Sven Gali who had enjoyed spectacular spectacular success producing the likes of Mud and Susie Quattro. His vision and perfectionism was exactly what they needed to achieve an amount of pop grandeur. This record had to sound as if there was no doubt that Blondie were now one of the best pop groups in the world. They were no longer punk, they were not dangerous, they were not sex and death on a rampage through a frightened and vulnerable middle America. They were just great pop. And so they began making truly great pop. Mike Chapman's view was that you should never commit to releasing anything you might be embarrassed about in 10 years' time. If you were all you claimed to be, and you had enough songs to prove it, there was no need to settle for anything less. As if to confirm their growing acceptance by the old guard of classic pop and rock music, they went out on tour with the Kinks, and drafted Robert Fripp in to record with them on the LP that would become Parallel Lines. The record contained enough classics to seal their reputation forever. Even without such signature Blondie songs as Hanging on the Telephone, Heart of Glass and Sunday Girl, there was enough good material to convince any sceptic that here, at last, was the record Blondie had always promised to make. As ever though, there were downsides. Robert Fripp told Debbie that he had it on good authority that US President Jimmy Carter had advised leading record executives that America had no desire for the new wave of rock music 
to take a hold on those golden shores. So, it had become official government policy to try to discourage radio stations from playing tracks by bands like Blondie. Debbie herself had been sent by Peter Leeds on a promo tour of the United States, trying to drum up support for the new album. Radio DJs had told her they liked the band, but didn't know what tracks to play. To Debbie, it seemed obvious. Play the songs that everyone likes. What could possibly be the problem? 